Hello, and welcome back to a very exciting bonus episode of Eldridge Girl. Um, this is the audio version of Gerald, which is an exclusive short story. You can only get it in the anniversary edition hardback of The Crows. Um, so that is going to disappear forever when Canelo Books take over, um, reissue The Crows in February 2024 as part of their new horror imprint, which launches in October this year, so October 2023. Um, they're launching with with John Langan's The Fisherman, um, and they've got uh, Sarah Langan, and they've got others as well, which I'm so excited about. Um, so you really need to check that out. And I am on that list too. The good news is that you'll be able to buy The Crows and 13th from me up until the date that they are reissued. So you can go and grab the illustrated versions now. Please grab them now um, because I don't know if the illustrations will be included. But also you can only grab the hardback from Amazon and the hardback has this short story in it. So after February, I might release the short story in its own anthology or something else. But if you want it as part of the anniversary edition, you're going to have to get it now. Um, and that's the one that has uh, the town map in it, the hardback version of The Crows. Um, and it also has all five illustrations by Tom Brown. It's got a new cover by Rebecca Kenny. And you can grab it from my Kofi shop in a book box. Um, it has extra wide margins for annotations and doodles and art. And you can do whatever you want with it. Um, the book box contains the candles. I've talked about that before. So check out ko-fi.com forward slash CM Rosens if you want to have a look. I've only got like one or two left, so be quick. Okay, so this is the backstory of Ricky, bless his heart, when he's 10 years old and it's his first ever um, meeting with Murthin. So this is referenced in The Day We Ate Grandad, and that's why it's a bonus episode right at the end of, the se of this season. Content warnings. There's a lot of animal death in this one because it's the creation of Gerald, his uh, taxidermy toy, which um, involved, you know, cutting up dogs and donkeys and things like that. There's no nothing on page, but he does describe kind of in his point of view what, what he did to the donkey in particular. So there's... Uh, I'm really sorry about that, but that's that's the kind of child he was. <laughs> um, there's also a lot of child neglect in this as well. That's on page and it's specifically emotional neglect. It's controlling of food and his reactions to the controlling of food um, and the development of his eating disorder, which he there's there's all of that. There's also uh, withholding of education, withholding specifically of physical affection and any form of uh, like affirmation and affirming love. So if that at all bothers you, this is probably one to skip. But that's I mean, you know what the but you know what his backstory is if you've got this far. So, yeah, it's just a lot of that. So here we go. Gerald. 18 years before the start of the Crows. He couldn't even think of her name any more without remembering how she'd tasted. He filled the oil lamp for his father, remembering Mrs Antram and her kind eyes, the lines around her mouth, her grey sheep's curls, and the slippery ridges of her brain, a similar shade of grey threaded with blood vessels hidden underneath. He remembered the creamy, jelly-like texture that held its shape in his mouth until he chewed, the raw animal aftertaste on his tongue, but reminding him of eggs. Mrs. Antrim had taught him the words for all the parts of the oil lamp, and now they nestled in his head rather than hers. His father nodded, made him wash his hands, and said it was time for dinner. Ricky wasn't allowed to eat too much dinner. Everything his mother cooked was dry and plain, boiled mercilessly to steam in the pans, but his father ate stoically without complaint, and Ricky had to, too. At least today there was something. There usually was when Dad got Mum a new girl. She should be dead by now, and he didn't know her name either. There was even a slice of Victoria sponge cake for dessert, but he wasn't supposed to have any. To him it smelled impossibly sweet, the edge of forbidden fructose driving every other thought out of his head. The dead girl got a slice of cake taken to her on a small china plate. Ricky didn't dare look over his shoulder as his mother hummed a little excited tune on her way down to the cellar. He focused on the sticky table edge, and the dark stain taunted him with shiny, jam-thick glaze, and the forbidden image of moist, light flesh, sugary and risen to perfection, bleeding raspberries and clots of fresh cream. 
Maybe he could have what the ants left, when it was stale and crumbling to biscuit dust on the plate. Maybe the insects would fill him with cake he wouldn't ever taste, like Mrs. Antram had filled him with words he didn't know. Maybe the dead girl would taste all the sweeter for rotting. He wouldn't be allowed to find out. He wondered what her name was, or at least what name his mother was using for her, but he wasn't supposed to ask. There wasn't any meat left in the outhouse. He cleaned up too thoroughly. His stomach gurgled, and all he could think about was cake. It clogged his farsight as surely as if he'd had a taste, pulling his focus away. His concentration was always worse as the days got lighter. He could read livers and the slippery parts of an animal easily in the darker, colder months, when the sharp blade of winter opened him up to the secrets steaming out of the guts in the frost-bitten air. But now everything was hazy with the flourishing of spring, everything thick and fertile and vital, and he was just as cold and dark inside, and nothing matched, nothing fitted, he didn't fit, and he couldn't see the future, only wished he could crawl out of his own skin. There was something under his skin, he knew. Something waiting, something strong, something he had grown to love. Like everything he loved, he couldn't touch it. He kept it jealously, his nameless secret, not wanting anyone else to give it a name or explain it to him, because that would feel like they were putting their grown-up fingers on what should only belong to him. He clung to his secrets, hoarding them like stolen sweets. One day the big secret inside him would emerge, and then he would be whole, complete, and every season would feel right, and he would be able to see whatever he wanted. The voice in his head told him so, but it didn't speak to him often. That was a secret too. And so was this, his taxidermy practice, something his father could be proud of him for. Ricky wasn't sure which he was more excited about, the hope of an approving nod, or the prospect of his completed companion. Ricky had taken to his father's hobby with intense interest, learning how to make other creatures as hollow as he was, and fill them back up, and how to thread needles that stabbed through his own flesh just as easily as their skins. Like everything else, he learned the hard way. The dog's forelimbs were ready to be attached to the body, his masterpiece. The rest of the dog was a bit useless with all the meat scraped off, so he had stuffed the bones and other bits he wasn't sure how to get rid of into the skin of the donkey that made up the main mass of the stuffed chimera. The donkey had been a trusting old thing. It let him get right up to it, let him pat it, and bury his fingers in its scraggy mane, as if it thought he was going to take it for a ride along the beach. Ricky knew at once this was the one. The other donkeys in the pen had showed their yellow teeth, brayed at him, snorted. Not this one. This one was friendly, and that was exactly what he wanted. Ricky had read enough to know that this was what friendliness looked like. He decided he wouldn't need to read books like that any more, once he had a friend of his own. He could read other things, real things, factual things with diagrams and big colour pictures. He didn't need books about other children and all the adventures they went on without him. They were silly, anyway. Nobody ever died in them. He'd realised some time ago that if he was going to make a friend, like in the books, he'd have to do it himself. He had managed to lead the donkey out of the stall and rode him all the way home, getting used to the smell of him, the soft feel of the hide under his hands and cheek. The donkey fitted in the outhouse pretty well, and Ricky had tied it up with the knots his father used on the girls. He'd ripped through the tough throat with his best, sharpest knife, all his weight behind the first thrust to break the hide, and it had nearly crushed him against the wall as it tried to shake him off and fell to the ground. His father had whipped him bloody with his belt for it, but let him keep it as butchery practice, and something Ricky could stuff by himself. Hacking the donkey's head off had been hard work, but every time he saw it he felt sick. It was a writhing kind of sickness deep in his belly, the cold, heavy kind— Ricky hated it. He couldn't understand why it made him feel that way now, when the donkey's expressive face had been so welcoming to start with. He got rid of the head and felt a little better. A deer skull with two majestic antlers would be a good replacement. It was his favourite thing after the smell of the donkey hide, now properly cleaned and treated. He sewed on the dog limbs with clumsy stitches, struggling to see and having to stop to wipe his eyes more than once. It didn't have a name yet. That was worrying him. He needed to give it a name, or else it wasn't a real friend, was it? But you didn't name your friends in books. They told you what their names were, or someone else introduced you. His chest fluttered tight. What if it didn't want to be his friend when it was finished? What if... what if it thought he'd done something bad? Ricky couldn't finish sewing it up. I never, he told it, and his voice came out in a tiny little croak. I never... 
He didn't know what he was denying. He never really did. People said he did things wrong a lot, but no one ever explained why. He concluded that adults just made things up in their heads the way they thought things should be and then forgot to tell him. He couldn't understand how his cousins seemed to play along, like they had been taken aside and someone had explained the rules of some game Ricky had never learned how to play. He wiped his nose with the back of his hand and sniffed. With one limb left to sew up, the creature was now very real and nearly ready. But Ricky didn't know if it would tell him its name. He couldn't bear the silence, the not knowing. No names came to mind. Ricky's imagination drew a blank. He ran out of the outhouse and snuck back into the cottage before his mother came back from giving the girl some cake. He was in bed before she came upstairs, his father out somewhere like he was most nights, and he listened breathlessly to her quiet whistle on the stairs. "'It's a robin, Mum,' he said, after the first cadence sitting up. She smiled at the wall outside his room, not looking at him, not yet. He had to earn that. First guess was a smile, second guess a look, third was a hug. Ricky gripped the blanket so hard his hands shook. She whistled again. Blackbird! She turned to look at him, still smiling. He drank it in, basking in her full attention. He wanted her hug so badly he forgot every bird in the whole bloody country. She whistled the third time. Ricky nearly blurted out the first thing that came into his head, but he bit it back. No, of course it wasn't a lark. Stupid. It was like a water bird, sharp with one low tone, and the repeated bursts of a higher one. She did it again, her smile turning down a little at one corner. Ricky tried to think. I haven't heard this one, he said, when she did it a third time. Mum, that's not fair. His mother shrugged. How will you learn new things? Ricky vibrated under the blanket. Is it a kind of gull? No, she sighed, pushing lank brown hair from her cheek. It's a wry neck. Can I hear it one more time so I'll know for next time? Ricky kneeled up on the mattress, knuckles white. She obliged, arms folded. Can I have a hug anyway, Mum? He wanted to tell her about the friend in the outhouse and ask her what he should do to make sure it told him its name. She shook her head and Ricky tugged the blanket taut. I guess the other two first go. Mum, I guess the first two right. I haven't heard that one before. That's not fair. Mum, please. You're too old to make a fuss, she said, unmoving. All three. That's the rule. You didn't guess. Now go to bed. I am. I am in bed, Mum, please. If you can't be trusted to play the game, we won't play it any more. Is that what you want? Ricky shook his head, clamping his mouth shut. Go to sleep, Richard. She closed the door, and Ricky stared at the back of it, trembling and stomach in knots. He threw up a few times that night out of his window, the nausea too urgent to make the bathroom. Ricky got back under his blanket and curled up, his stomach sore. He wished he had something soft and warm to curl up with, to hold. He'd wanted something like that ever since he was five, and he'd asked why Cousin Layla had a bunny toy she carried around with her everywhere. The idea you could have something like that, a constant companion, something to hold and chew and squeeze to make the bad feelings go away, had grown up with him. He'd never been allowed anything like that, after they realised he could see the future more clearly without comfort. He drifted into a restless, light sleep and dreamed a Victoria sponge cake. He dreamed he was filling his belly with it until he nearly burst, and he couldn't stop eating it even when he realised it wasn't cake at all, just plaster covered with lip gloss like the dead girls and dusted with dry paint. The jam was writhing with fat red beetles sticky with their own excretions, and the seeds were tiny black mites that would nibble away at his insides if he swallowed them, but he couldn't pick them out and he couldn't stop shoveling it into his mouth, and no matter how much he ate, there was always more, and he had to eat it until it was gone because he'd wanted it so badly. Gran was there, and his mother, not looking at him, and his father glaring like stone. I only wanted a small piece, Ricky begged, crying now, trying to stop himself, but forcing a fistful of the cake's squirming guts into his own mouth. He could feel them inside him, gnawing him full of holes. Ungrateful boy, his father said. Nothing ever good enough. Do you want to lose what makes you special? Isn't that cake just as good? Oh, George, his mother said, now staring at his father. If he bursts, we can have a little girl, can't we? We can have a lovely little girl. Ricky woke up with a lurching start and retched bile and spit out of the window in the cold light of dawn. His stomach was nowhere near bursting, and that was a relief. Ricky supposed that was selfish, though. For a moment he wasn't sure if that was something his mother really hoped for, or if it was just in the dream. He decided not to complain about dinner again, not to ask for more, just in case they gave it to him and he really did burst. He didn't want to disappear like that. 
but that was only a passing thought, and by breakfast he'd managed to sleep a little longer, and by the second time he woke he'd forgotten all about it. He ate his old bruised apple and drank his tepid water, and went out to run across the fields and find something to do. The first thing he did was to visit the old house on Redditch Lane, and tell her all about his new friend in the outhouse and ask what she thought about it. Ricky had loved that house, so majestic and quiet, since he was little. It called him strongly this morning. He could hear her song, drifting through the trees and pulling him towards her. It wasn't a tune, and there wasn't a throat to produce it, but it was the sound of ruin and splendour, the sound memories made, the sound of longing and decay. It seeped into his bones, penetrating him to the core, and filling him with rich, atonal music. The back wall had partially fallen in, and a wire had been strung in the large gap by the estate agents or somebody, not that it would keep anyone out. Ricky couldn't duck underneath like the intrepid children of the town and surrounding farms, though. The house called to him, but it also repelled him if he got too close, and seared his fingers if he reached over the boundary line. He'd done it once and received small acid burns that were healing nicely now, just on his fingertips. He wondered if it would really burn up his whole hands if he held them there long enough, or tried touching the wall. One day he thought he'd be brave enough to find out. He wanted the house to mark him, wanted to have something of hers. Now it wasn't hurting so much, he liked the discoloured patches from that first time. She was under his skin now. "'What if it won't tell me its name?' he asked aloud. The house watched him, windows glinting grey in the morning light. Most were smashed, but one definitely seemed to be staring in his direction. Maybe it was the spiderweb craze of cracks on the side of the pane that made it look like that, but he was sure she knew he was there. He settled under his favourite tree where he could see through the gap in the wall, and she could stare back. "'I didn't guess again last night,' he said. "'It was a Rhineck, and it sounds like this.' He whistled the Rhineck's call. "'I'll get it tonight. I'm going to learn all of them.' His thoughts bounced back to the creature in the outhouse. "'What if it won't tell me? If it does, and it wants to be my friend, will you let me in then? If I show you I've got friends, other friends, will you let me?' The house didn't change its song. Ricky took a deeper breath, trying not to panic. The crow soothed him. It didn't feel like it was promising anything, but he could live with not knowing, or not knowing yet. He'd figure out how to see his own future properly soon. The puppy had only said his cousin's friend would not make any new friends for a while, which he'd interpreted as including him. He'd been right. But he couldn't see if he would make any new friends. All right, currently it wasn't much of a friend. Its body was round and soft, full of straw and stuffing and bits and bones, and the antlered skull was tricky to attach, and he wasn't sure it would stay on yet. And it had no ears, and a limb missing. It needed some eyes too, but eyes were really hard. They would have to be glass for now, but the ones his father had for the stuffed animals wouldn't work in a skull. He'd have to think about it. Oi! A brusque voice cut the air from the other side of the fence. Ricky leapt up, flushing brightly. What are you doing here? Nothing, Ricky denied, then corrected himself as Gran glared at him in his mind's eye. Nothing, just sitting. You smashed these windows? No, Ricky glowered, shivering. I never, it was some boys from town. I chase them off sometimes if I catch them. Oh, do you? A man older than his father came into view from behind the broken wall, out of place in a casual brown suit, a clean linen shirt with a stiff collar and a forest green tie. His short grey hair was neatly combed, his matching brown leather shoes polished, but a little muddy. Ricky realised he wasn't dressed properly enough to talk to this man, and Gran would be cross if she knew. He drew his eyes up to the man's face. There was something not right with it. Ricky couldn't put his finger on what was wrong, just that it was both familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. It was a strong, lean face with a nose like an eagle and sharp, dark eyes. The man wasn't tall, but he was imposing. There was a wildness to him under the suit that Ricky didn't trust, as if the suit was just one of many skins the man wore when it suited him. "'Do you want to look around, then?' the man asked. He had an accent Ricky couldn't quite place. It wasn't English, or like the English accents he'd heard. It was rich and lilting, harmonising with the background soundscape of Fairwood's song. Ricky flushed harder and shook his head. "'No? Not a look inside?' I just came for a quick check on the old place. Got the keys. You can have five minutes, but you stick to the ground floor. He had a glint in his eye as if this was a test of some kind. Ricky swallowed hard. 
It was like the way his gran offered him gingerbread with the rest of his cousins, who were all allowed to take a piece. He had to prove to her he put his far sight first, and was always expected to say no. "'No, thank you,' the man shrugged. "'Well, sensible boy. You were told not to talk to strangers, I presume?' Ricky scowled. He didn't want to be shown up in front of the house, or she might never let him in. "'I can talk to who I want.' The man laughed. "'That's so. Big man, is it? Well, if you don't want to look around while supervised, I'd better not catch you here later, do you understand?' Ricky nodded. "'Where are your parents? Why aren't you in school?' "'In work, I'm off sick,' Ricky repeated the lie mechanically, having learned it by rote. "'You don't look well enough to be sat on the damp grass,' the man said, taking a better look at him. Ricky squirmed. "'I was sick last night. I'm all right now.' "'Just not enough to be in school?' "'Yeah. But enough to be out here on your own, in short sleeves, in this damp weather in the woods.' Ricky realised this was a grown-up trick. "'Mum and Dad don't know.' The man frowned, and Ricky realised he'd said the wrong thing. "'I promised to stay in bed until Gran comes. It's not their fault.' Another lie, well rehearsed, but he stumbled over it, trying to put all the words in the right order. He hadn't been convincing. The man didn't believe him. "'What's that bruise on your arm, son?' He dropped his tone until it was almost kind. Ricky knew not to say anything at all. He shut his mouth and pursed his lips tightly. The man watched him dust himself down and start walking away. He had a knife, his pocket knife, if the man followed him. The best place was the inner thigh. The artery there would mean he'd bleed and bleed and bleed. Stomach for slow, throat for quick. At his height, and since he was so light and not very strong, not yet, not grown-up strong, he'd have to get the man down to his level to cut his throat. He'd only done it once, and the man had been tied up and sat down. Ricky fingered the hilt of his knife in his pocket. He could do it, though. He wouldn't even be sick this time. "'Show the house the proper respect, do you?' The man was right in front of him, as if he'd circled around, silent as a bat, and was now leaning against a tree a little way away. He must have a very long stride, or Ricky just hadn't been paying attention. Ricky swallowed. His uncles could do that, move silently and twist the world into shapes that suited them, so that distance was meaningless. Perhaps other people could, too. This man couldn't be a relative of his. He had been on the other side of the fence. He stopped, squaring his shoulders. Yes, ask her. The man smiled, amused. If that's true, why'd she burn your fingers? Ricky thrust both hands into his pockets. He gripped the knife. Who are you? The man shrugged. People call me lots of things. I don't know if you've heard of me yet, but you will. The eyes became ads sharp, boring into him. Maybe you just need to read the right books. Which ones? Ricky hadn't noticed how dry his mouth was until he tried to swallow again, and nearly gagged on his own tongue. Oh, you'll find them. Old ones. Ones that breathe ink and gall. Ones written on cracked skin, scraped thin as paper. Ricky flared his nostrils, lost in an intense eruption of greed. Where are they? You'll find them. The man dug in his own pocket and tossed something silvery at him. Think fast. Ricky released the knife and caught the object without thinking as it flew at his face in a blurred arc. It was a set of keys that wrapped his knuckle and bit into his palm. I dare say there are those who will think I ought to kill you, given that I know what you are. The man gave him a sad smile with no malice in it. And we know, don't we, what blood is spilt on this soil, and what blood will be spilled upon the wheel under the moon and the dancing flame, and we know, don't we, what goes on in those respects houses of your kinfolk behind their neck curtains and in their catalogue kitchens, what goes into their four-course dinner parties and their utter, utter disrespect for the laws of nature and the laws of man and the laws of anything else. He put his head on one side. And I can see you know, and you do not care. And so, maybe, maybe I should take this destiny off your shoulders, my boy. Maybe I should conceal it in a rock or a lake or in that knife you have in your pocket and give it to someone else. Ricky took a step back. You can't kill me. The man's smile was cold. Yes, I can. He straightened up and suddenly didn't look like an estate agent in a nice suit any more. To his burning shame, a trickle of urine escaped and ran down Ricky's leg. His father would beat him bloody if he knew. 
The man smiled soft and sad. I'm not a child killer. I'm not a child, Ricky thought. Poor boy. The man shook his head, and Ricky could swear his hair was getting longer, shaggier, darkening around his face. Even your thoughts ring hollow. He cocked his head. I know what it is to be a child with a terrible destiny. So I give you those keys, and you will find those books in the usual places where books can be found, and you will learn. And I will come back. Ricky struggled to remember if the man had had a beard to start with, but there was certainly one now, and he looked like he belonged to a much older time, a different age. Let's sort you out, lad. Ricky instantly felt his legs go from tacky to clean. His trousers were dry, with no trace of his shame. He didn't like these, anyway. All the things his mother dressed him in were too short or too tight as he grew, and all were too scratchy, too itchy, or didn't feel right in ways he couldn't describe. Focusing on his too short trousers, now dry as boiled bones, made him feel better. He remembered his manners. Thank you, he mumbled almost incoherently into the ground. You're welcome. He dared raise his eyes. The man was back to looking like a kindly older gent in a suit, and Ricky sniffed back a lump of fear. He tried squaring his shoulders again, but he'd already wet himself once, and his heart wasn't in it. Mad bearded old bastard, he thought to himself to make himself braver. Do I have to teach you some manners? The man scowled, and Ricky flinched away, horrified that even the private spaces inside his head were not secret, were not his, where this stranger was concerned. He covered his ears and scrunched his eyes shut, holding his breath to stop more thoughts escaping. When he let out a breath because he had to, the man was chuckling at him, and Ricky tugged his own hair, cheeks hot and starved guts writhing. "'I'm going away for a while,' the man continued, settling back, apparently satisfied by Ricky's reaction. "'There's nothing I can do here for the time being, and it's been a while since I last travelled. Thought I'd drop by before I went, visit the places where magic in my heart language still lingers.' Ricky frowned. Well, "'What's a heart language?' "'You'll know it,' the man cocked his head and said something in a language Ricky had never heard before, with a cadence he wasn't confident enough to copy. "'Do you know what that means?' Ricky shook his head. "'It's Middle Welsh. Let him who would be a leader be a bridge. Do you understand?' "'No?' "'No, you're too young yet. Well, perhaps this, then.' The man said something else, and the way he said it, staring through Ricky's soul, made it resonate in his chest. His breath caught in wonder. Gran says things like that. Yes, I'm sure she does. It's old English. Closer to modern German than it is to modern English, but I think a bright boy like you, with your sharp little mind, you'll be able to pick it up. I won't tell you what it means. You can find out for yourself. Use those keys there. Your Mrs. Antram didn't have a full set, did she? Ricky went cold. He couldn't know about that. He had kept the keys to the library, the one she had with her in her handbag the night his father had killed her, for daring to teach Ricky to read. He knew at once what this set was for. The records and archives on the lower ground floor and the stacks behind the door marked staff only. The man had not come any closer, but fear prickled the length of Ricky's spine. Why can't you just teach me, if you know so much? The man clicked his tongue. I told you I'm going away for a while. I won't be here. Besides, your family will soon sort itself out, I see. What is now twelve will soon be thirteen. Ricky didn't like the way the man flashed his teeth when he said that, and had the impression those teeth were much larger, much sharper than they ought to be. He was like a fox, this man. A wolf. A bear. A dragon. Where are you going? What am I supposed to do? How do I see the future properly all the time? I had kin all over Europe once, as far as Constantinople, but they don't call it that now. And you're being taught the ways of the Romans, I see, but no matter. Many a soothsayer before you learned all kinds of ways to read the truth in the world. You should try bones. Or runes. Go and commune with the dead, if you have the backbone for it, and see what happens to the inside of that skull of yours. Ricky shivered. Thirteen is bad, he whispered. Ain't that a bad number? Doesn't have to be bad, the man said. It's just a number. And it doesn't have to be bad for you, even if it's bad for them. Ricky pulled a face, sceptical. If it's bad for them, it's all as bad for me. When you grow up a bit, maybe things will change. The man gave a decisive nod, as if th that was the end of the conversation. So you do that. Read, learn, practice, bide your time. You'll know when it's right. Try not to fuck it up, boy, and I won't have to come back at all. Ricky bit his lower lip hard, thoughts whirling. He clung to the keys, letting the rough edges bite into his hand. 
He'd not read a lot of books with heroes in, the kind that had destinies to fulfil, but in the ones he had read they always had companions. He didn't. The casual try-not-to-fuck-it-up echoed in his head like a death knell. Oh, the man said over his shoulder as he headed through the trees, stopping as if he had just remembered something. Send Gerald my regards. He says he's looking forward to making your acquaintance when you've patched him up properly. Ricky's heart lurched hard against his ribs. He broke and ran all the way home. Back in the outhouse, Gerald was sitting up against the back wall, not where Ricky had left him. The last limb was stitched up neatly by more experienced hands than his, and for a wild moment Ricky wondered if Gerald had done it himself. But there, beside the lumpy body that folded in the middle, greyhound ribs making their presence known under the hide and through the straw, was a box of ginger biscuits and a bag of sweets. Ricky couldn't stop himself. He tore the box open first and ate them all, every crumb, crunching through them so fast he almost forgot to savour the taste. The sweets were even better, but the sugar electrified him. Tooth-rotting jelly of lurid, poisonous colours, artificial tastes tanging on his tongue and a cocktail of forbidden fruit. He had a stomachache afterwards that wouldn't go away, but he didn't care. He had a friend now, a cracked cream skull that stared sightlessly down at him through empty sockets, a warm, musty body he could wrap his arms around when he needed to, limbs that hung down over his shoulders with a pleasing weight and never pushed him away. Ricky made sure his mother was in the cellar playing with the dead girl, and dragged Gerald up to his bedroom, where he would be safe and out of the way, much drier than the outhouse. He hoped his father would be impressed. It wasn't a toy, so he couldn't say it was childish. He pulled the creature onto his mattress and curled up around him as his belly groaned with stabs of sugary pain, and forgot all about the stranger in the woods for a while, safe in the embrace of his new patchbag companion. This is how it starts, he whispered to the eyeless, earless skull, eyelids heavy, queasy again with a sugar crash. I don't feel so good now, but when I'm better we'll go on adventures. This is how it starts. He tugged Gerald closer, liking the way things moved and compressed under Gerald's new skin. Can I tell you a secret? The skull seemed to nod as Ricky squeezed him tighter, and Ricky took this as a yes. He brought his mouth up to where he thought the ears ought to be, and whispered as loudly as he dared, I'm going to be a king when I grow up. Better than a king. You watch. I'll be better than all of them. The man in the woods felt like a dream. Ricky still had the keys, though, the only evidence it wasn't, and they dug into his leg as he curled up, burying his face in the donkey hide. "'I'll get you proper hands,' he promised, "'and proper innards, and real eyes and ears, too.' His father would have to be impressed, then. Ricky drifted off to sleep, belly still complaining, and not sure of the time. When he awoke, he couldn't remember where he'd got the keys in his pocket from, but he felt refreshed, as if something had changed. The world felt different, somehow less frightening. Ricky sat up, even his stomach ache gone, and smiled to himself. He wasn't so alone any more. He had Gerald now, and they had things to do. So there we go. Absolutely heartbreaking, I hope. <laughs> um, I hope you enjoyed that. That was Gerald, the bonus short story that is in the back of the hardback version of The Crows, which you can get until February um, from Amazon only. So there we go. I hope that that kind of explains a little bit about Ricky's character as well in The Crows, where you can see him being naturally quite affectionate and the way that he is with Carrie when he gets more confident. Um, but it's always on his terms because he's not, he doesn't trust affection on somebody else's terms, like somebody else giving him affection. He always is like, mm, what do you want? Because he always thinks that that's transactional. And then he's just not used to being touched by other people unsolicited. So it becomes a sensory thing and he just doesn't like it um, because he doesn't know what it means. And he doesn't, he's just not used to how it feels. So it feels wrong. But it's also why he will initiate with Carrie and he will hug her or hug her back when he gets a little bit more used to that and why immediately as soon as he gets into the tactile part of the relationship that becomes like you can you can see how that would be his love language if he wasn't so fucked up um and so it's just really interesting to see how a little boy like that could get to where he is in the crows and also all that stuff that is all tangled up with a lot of the family 
kind of issues that he has and also that desperation to be wanted by them and be respected by them and his primary motivation is to get that affection from them and that's kind of why he never really leaves and also because he it's very hard to for someone like that I think to start again in a new place when you've built a reputation and something you know you've you've built everything that you have is around the place that is also hurting you but you can't leave it because if you go somewhere new you have to start again and he he's not he's not here for that uh, <laughs> um but he also doesn't know what to do with himself so everything kind of gets turned inward with Ricky he doesn't turn it outward and blame other people he does and he he kind of is like no I, I hate you all <laughs> but um as, as like an adult or as a you know but at the same time he will still do his grandmother shopping every Friday and he will look after his parents and he will you know kind of look after the house and all that kind of stuff so yeah it's just really interesting um so I hope that's all come out a bit more for you in that story. I want to do a few more stories um, from his childhood. <laughs> equally equally bad and just seriously fucking depressing. Um, and from his teenage years where he's just off his face most of the time. Um, and then, I don't know, like some of his uh, 20s, um, things like that. So you get to see the trajectory. Um, but yeah, he's come a long way. I'm very proud of him, actually quite proud of his arc <laughs> um, and in a way he's kind of getting back to what he was like as a kid and there's a lot of undoing what he's learned and like undoing learned behavior and he is becoming a bit more like this now I, I don't know like yeah in, term, in terms of the affection and like what he what he wants and being able to admit that that's what he wants yeah and I think you can see the ADHD and possibly like or, or DHD, like, um, like possibly he's autistic as well. Um, I don't know. Like, he's definitely, definitely neurodivergent in some very neurospicy way. <laughs> but yeah, I think that just made a lot of sense. And he's just, yeah, just he just needs a friend. He just needs help, really. That was Gerald, the short story. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> I look forward to uh, doing some more audio for you for The Reluctant Husband. And then also The Sussex Fretzel Massacre. Don't take that one too seriously. That is literally just a bit of fun. But that is where he meets uh, Ollie, who is a new friend that he makes, like an actual friend. So I'm quite excited for that one. Um, okay, so that's that. And I will see you next time. Bye now.